will certainly like to welcome you here. It's my um, privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Mike Adler, who is a member of the Geologist of Jackson Hole, amongst many, many other things uh, that he does. Mike is a 1971 graduate of MIT, has a PhD in the area of solid state physics. He had a nearly 30 year career with General Electric, where he guided large development research programs. And following his uh, career at GE, he helped to develop microfuel cells for devices such as cell phones. And he's also been an adjunct professor at RPI. He's published uh, over 100 technical papers, has been active in the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and electronics engineers for 30 years and was elected a fellow of the IEEE for his work on power devices and was the IEEE president in 2003. He and his wife Virginia have lived here in Jackson Hole for 14 years now where in addition to being members of the geologists of Jackson Hole he's passionate about the night sky and I would just uh, mention as a preview that there will be another one of his uh, displays of uh, deep space photography in January, uh, February, uh, out here in the gallery as part of the library program. Uh, he really does take stunning photos of celestial bodies. Other hobbies are skiing, climbing, hiking, travel, and photography, the last two of which are very pertinent to tonight uh, because he's going to talk about uh, not only geology but uh, actually trips, I guess, more than one, or is it just one? And there's, uh, I've been there twice. Okay, there there it yeah. travels to Iceland, uh, so you'll see a lot. This is one of my spectacular photographs right here. And he, of course, is also going to talk about the geology of this very, very special place, Iceland. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Mike Adler. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, he, this actually comes from uh, Thor's book, but if we take Earth as one year old, Iceland was born two days ago. So uh, the surface of Iceland has changed a lot. There's been uh, a million cubic meters of uh, erosion occurring yearly, but volcanic activity keeps up with it. And in fact, the overall effect is that Iceland is still growing. And so this is a, a graphical picture uh, that shows Iceland itself right here. And this is the mid-ocean ridge that goes right through the middle of Iceland. And you'll see the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the part, other parts of uh, the uh, volcanic activity go on both sides. And uh, this red dot is where the hot spot is. So that's the other unique feature, is that not only is Iceland on this ridge, it sits right over a volcanic hot spot. And this was where it was about 70 million years ago, and this is where it is right now, dead set, right underneath Iceland. Um, the geology. The prelude to Iceland forming what occurred 400 million years ago, when the previous ocean, other than the Atlantic, collapsed or narrowed. Uh, it was called the Ipidus Ocean. Then about 70 million years ago, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Atlantic began to form. And, uh, and, it, and bo as both sides of, uh, of the uh, ocean moved apart, there was a new plate boundary, and that's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And normally, these, the ridge is not above sea level. In fact, the only place that it is above sea level is in Iceland. And the hot spot underneath this, has, over 65 million years, has uh, put up over 10 million cubic uh, kilometers of magma and brought it above the sea level. The ridge is over, uh, so the, the volcanic region is 2,000 kilometers long, and it's called the North Atlantic Igneous Province. The surface expression of this plate boundary are these various, uh, the actual ridge and the various uh, volcanic uh, and activity as well as uh, numerous uh, faulting that occurs in the same area. So the plate boundary is Iceland's major geological showcase going right through. Um, this is um, uh, uh, a simplified map of Iceland, and you can see all these red areas are where there is a volcanic activity. So the volcanic activity pretty much tracks the same path as the mid-ocean ridge does going through it. The darker areas were areas where there was volcanic activity in the tertiary uh, times, uh, somewhere greater than three million years ago. Uh, and. Um, but th this is where the activity is at the most. It starts at the southwest corner and then runs right through the island and exits on the north, on the north side. <clears throat> you know, also this, uh, and I said that, this area uh, where the ridge is is also where the, the greatest faulting occurs. So what actually happens is, happens is that you have this rising magma that's uh, coming up uh, through the ridge, uh, the rift, and uh, depositing itself. But then as this happens in sequences, it's the middle sags down. So there's a, there's a syncline that exists. But then the, uh, the various layers get pushed, uh, pushed away by new layers coming in. And that forms an anticline on, the, on both sides. So that, that's basically the dynamics that are going on uh, in Iceland as we speak. Um, one of the uh, amazing features of Iceland, though, is there's ice there, and there's glaciers. Uh, and this uh, these series of diagrams show you what the uh, glacial formation was like starting five million years ago, uh, two and a half, all the way down to uh, 10,000 years ago, or, uh, where the glacial uh, was at its maximum, covering virtually the whole uh, the whole island. The other thing that happened during the same period is that the rift, which was originally far farther west, has gradually moved east to where it is right now. And then, so if you look at what, what volcanic activity, uh, how it happens of when you have the island covered by, uh, uh, island covered by um, uh, glaciers, uh, you have maybe three different things that can happen. One is that the volcanic activity never gets above the ice level. And that forms uh, uh, some pillow lava that, uh, that is, is visible around the island in various places. If it actually breaks the surface, you get something called a mover, which is essentially a, a large uh, hill. And if it continues to go, 
you'll actually reach a, create a, a table mountain. And all forms of these exist in Iceland. So this is some of the, uh, these are just some pictures I took. Uh, this is the pillow lava uh, that uh, occurs quite often uh, around the island. You'll see examples of it. This is the aha lava, which is a viscous basaltic lava that is steep and irregular. And then there are other places where it was much more, where the lava was much smoother, and it's uh, pahohoi lava. And it's very interesting, these names come from Hawaii, by the way, where we're going for the field trip. So the other great place, one of the other amazing places, obviously, for, uh, for uh, volcanic activity is Hawaii, and, and these names actually come from there. So this was the trip that we took. It was done, uh, this trip was a little more, well, about a year ago. And uh, the red line is where we went. And it started at Reykjavik, which is here, and uh, the very first day we got there, we went out to the uh, southwest corner where the mid-Atlantic ridge comes ashore. And then we gradually started working our way counterclockwise around the, uh, around the island. And, uh, and, pretty much, and we, the way we did it uh, was it was a self-drive tour. We had a travel agent who made uh, hotel reservations for us around the island but, uh, and gave us a vehicle and gave us some information. And then I also, um, a key part of the, the whole thing was uh, Thor Thorensen's guidebook. And it's an ex excellent guidebook because it actually runs you around the island. It doesn't just talk about the general geology. It actually talks about this, the outcrops and things along the way as you go around the island. So it's an uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding book. And it's now out in the second edition. So, and the trip that we did was about, it was a 12-day, 11-night trip uh, that, that occurred. It was also, I chose the time very carefully that it happened to be a moonless period. And by the way, uh, the next, next year, same time, the next year trip in, uh, in uh, September is also moonless. Okay, so this is the corner. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, southwest corner of the Recanes uh, Peninsula. And this is where the ridge comes ashore. And you find all this broken rock that's endemic of, of, uh, of, that, of that process. You can see it here, um, uh, broken up. There are, you'll, you'll see some examples of it uh, further inland that are even much more dramatic than this. But basically, the rift is a shallow 10 mile, 10 kilometer wide robin. It's uh, a depressed area between two normal faults and is thermally active. And uh, along the, the center are these 400 to, uh, 40 to 100 meter uh, Moberg Hills, which uh, were formed when eruptions occurred but not underneath the glacier, as I just sort of talked about. So this, in fact, what, this lighthouse right at the, the, the corner, at the southwest corner, is on top of one of these Moberg Hills. And you can see the uh, volcanic activity that occur that is everywhere in this uh, southwest corner, and uh, a lot of these Moberg hills were formed uh, at the end of the last glaciation at 10,000 years ago. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of what the terrain looks like on the southwest <coughs> corner. Um, a lot of uh, lava fields, this aha uh -uh lava, aha uh -uh lava, and the Moberg hills around. But this is interesting too. This is also in the southwest. And uh, here you see a, a manifestation of the rift itself uh, with the uh, faults, two faults, and the uh, graben in between. And the rift is pretty much running right through there. Uh, and uh, this is, um, this is uh, jet again in that southwest corner. So we have active thermal area right here. But look, notice the plant in the background. Uh, uh, Iceland generates all of its heating uh, using uh, hydro, using the uh, volcanic thermal activity, and uh, I don't think anyone pays for uh, uh, for heating in Reykjavik. It, uh, it is all provided. So, okay, so this is a little <coughs> more detail of the map, uh, and we, where we were just at is this very southwest corner right here. Here's Reykjavik. So the next day, uh, we ended up doing what's called the Golden Triangle, and uh, the, uh, yeah, the Golden Triangle are Pinglevir, Geyser, and Gullfoss, and uh, it's, it's this loop right here. And this was our, our first night was here, our second night is, uh, was right here near uh, Selfoss. So, 
some of the amazing scenery that we had. Which is, um, this is the Lake of Pingla, Pinglavatn. It's the largest. Uh, one of the challenges of giving this talk, by the way, are pronouncing these. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if there's anyone from Iceland who can actually do this, I would, appre I would appreciate the help because I, I, I'm going to pretty well uh, murder some of these uh, words. But um, anyway, this was just a spectacular day. And one thing we didn't appreciate uh, when we were going on the trip uh, was all the fall colors. You know, there's not that much uh, vegetation on, on Iceland, but there is some. But there's also this lower growth, the bushes, that turn this very nice color. And so that was quite a surprise. And uh, this also, this, uh, the other significance of this particular place at Pingalolatin, it turned out it was the uh, site of the General Assembly of Iceland that occurred uh, in uh, about 1000 AD. Uh, and this is also, as you'll see shortly, some amazing geology here associated with the rift, which goes right through here. And this is the picture without the words, so you can just you know, uh, see how, how pretty it is. This was very typical of the, the days we had with these big skies, and it's just sort of a, uh, a big sky country. Uh, it was amazing. Real, lots of wonderful uh, photography uh, opportunities. So this 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 is this is this this amazing manifestation. This is a, a giant crack, and it's, it's called Almananga, which is seven, uh, almost eight kilometers long. It's 64 meters wide on the average, and it's caused by the spreading of the seafloor, which is occurring uh, underneath Iceland. And there's an opposing fault, which is on the other side of the uh, rift, which is about uh, uh, 10 kilometers away. But uh, this, this particular uh, sector is just amazing to come across this and see this. Um, there, the the graben in between these two um, uh, faults uh, has subsided uh, 70 meters in the last 9,000 uh, uh, years. So this its center area, this is high on each side and the center area is dropped down. This is some of the scenery that was uh, right there uh, in uh, at Pigalair, and a uh, cute small little waterfall uh, and water running right through the, uh, the actual dike. And this is looking the other way, and you can just see uh, all the uh, basaltic uh, lava blocks and what have you, plus the beautiful uh, uh, color in the, uh, in the bushes. I don't want to go through these pictures too fast because they're oxidized. Not bad. There's, here's some of the foliage uh, looking uh, closely right up at it. So this is a nice time of year to be there. It and, uh, and, well, should be the same time of year. It will be close to the same time of year next year. This is some of the cliffs. The, that, the, the gorge, that, that, uh, the rift that I was showing you is right up underneath there. It's right up there. <clears throat> and here's that uh, -hoy -hoy lava flow, uh, the uh, low viscosity. Uh, plus, uh, plus basalt lava. And this is back down right at the lake level. And uh, there are some trees, and you can see they're actually in a, a nice fall color. Okay, so this is the, um, uh, this is the first of the giant waterfalls. One of the major features of going to Iceland is seeing all the waterfalls. You'll see quite a few of them in this talk. Uh, this is the Gullfoss, and it's, uh, it drops 32 meters. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, the, um, this very high gorge, a 70 meter high gorge. The waterfall has uh, been carved over the last 10,000 years. It moves about 25 centimeters a year. What's going on is that the lava uh, on, on the surface is more resistant to erosion than the sedimentary layers underneath. The sedimentary layers. Uh, get uh, eroded and uh, and then uh, the, the lava block drops off but in the, so the, the falls are moving along at 25 centimeters a year and you can see the people up here if you want to get a sense of the scale uh, and that's the picture without the words and this next picture is kind of nice too um, the sun came up 
And uh, that's what's, uh, it, this is not a, a rainstorm, this is simply the spray that's caused by the, uh, this huge waterfall uh, and the sun hitting it. You'll see the two, uh, the two rainbows. So this is still our, this is our first full day and we're, we're going south now and we stopped at this, um, at, uh, something <coughs> called the Cario Splatter a Volcano. It's 6,000 years old. Uh, it's a scoria cone. What that all means is, it, is that the, the, uh, the, the eruption is throwing up uh, liquid lava that has uh, in the air and it comes down when it lands. It uh, lands as a liquid and it also, uh, uh, so that's what it means by a splatter volcano. And the scoria is lava <coughs> with gas bubbles in it. And that's why, that's typical of a explosive volcano that there's a lot of gas in the lava and that ultimately the pressure from that gas is what causes the explosive activity. Very pretty though, um, just in its own right. Yeah, the car, the road that goes by here goes right over there. Okay, so this is the next um, uh, installment on the map. Um, so we were up in the uh, Pingvillar, Pingvillar area up here. We're now going along the uh, south coast, and you start seeing the, the uh, big glaciers. Uh, the Afa, Yao, Yoko, Mirdas, Moko, and then the big one is up here, uh, and uh, uh, you'll see shortly. But so we spent, uh, this is kind of a, a day for us was on the average of about 100 and maybe 150 miles, 120 mile drive, but with a lot of stops along the way. And so there's one of the volcanoes and uh, also uh, the glacier on top of it. And a local denizen. So this is uh, the next uh, falls uh, as you go along. Uh, this is the Shell Jalan Foss. Uh, Foss, by the way, is waterfall in Icelandic. Uh, this one is 65 meters high. There's a trail that goes behind here, which uh, there's a person right there. Give me a, uh, and it, you, you get very wet doing that. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a beautiful waterfall. Um, and this is the same picture, but this is very close to it, just a little ways down the, uh, there's a trail that run, runs along here. And there's, uh, you can see another waterfall inside here. This is, a, this is one of the, there were, I should mention there was uh, four of us on this, just, uh, just four of us, uh, Virginia and I, and so, uh, some friends of ours, the Grants from Kingston, Ontario, which we met years ago on, in Antarctica. We continue to do things together, and in fact, we're going to be going to Spain uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, starting tomorrow, and we're going to meet with these same folks. Uh, so this is the next um, waterfall. This is called the Skoka Foss. Uh, not, uh, not as hard to pronounce. Again, the um, waterfalls of the, uh, the uh, rainbows. This one is 60 meters high. And this is uh, above the waterfall. Uh, so we, we hiked up back a ways. And this is this infamous uh, 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 volcano that caused all the air flight delays in 2010. It looks very peaceful right now. Uh, yeah. This, I uh, know we're further, going further along. This is one of the uh, outlet uh, uh, glaciers from the larger glacier, the Miradas Yokel. Um, it drops down 1,600 meters to 100 meters. Uh, uh, near the ocean. The glacier is about a kilometer shorter than it was in 1930 and about 130 meters thinner. And so the global warming and, uh, is, is affecting Iceland as well. Particularly, I mean, all of the northern part of, of the, uh, the globe is being most affected by global warming. So you've got to get here while this stuff is still there. It's not going away anytime soon, though. This is uh, without the the words again. Again, there's just a beautiful uh, sky along with the, uh, this is afternoon so the lighting is quite nice. And this is just looking the other way from the same spot. You can see the, uh, uh, the uh, 
moraine, the, the, the lateral moraine on this side. So this is uh, Dies Hole. It's the southernmost point in Iceland, uh, 63 degrees, uh, just under 63 degrees, 23 minutes. Uh, and again, this was at the uh, close to the end of the day, so we have some very nice lighting here. Um, so this is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, this is uh, some of the uh, Pahoe, Pahoe lava. Uh, it was, uh, again, uh, mafic, rich in iron and, and, and light in, uh, in, in silica. In silica. Uh, but it has this interesting uh, cube jointing that's occurred, and it's hap that happens because it w when it was uh, when the lava first came up, it was probably underwater, and in the cooling process, uh, the cracks develop in the uh, in, in the uh, lava and form these uh, interesting shapes. So most of the terrain around here results from the uh, welded tuff from the explosive eruptions. Uh, and those occurred underwater, so they're hydromagmatic, mag it's called. This is the same spot, just looking in the other direction. Now, this is looking inland. Uh, you can see the glacier, uh, the Muridus Fall Glacier, uh, in the background here. So these are uh, I, there are lots of horses uh, in Iceland. These small horses, and these are um, uh, these are uh, what they call whooper swans, which is uh, their version of a trumpeter, uh, trumpeter swan. Uh, but they're look they're very similar in appearance, but they're the coloring, particularly in the beak, is different. But they make the they make the uh, the uh, whoop 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 sound. So now we're entering what's called the fire districts. This is the area where in, in, in um, more or less in the last thousand years where most of the volcanic activity has been. And uh, it's created some major eruptions that have uh, had its effect all over the world. Uh, and uh, so here's the, here's the uh, um, FIA Yokol, Miridus Yokol, and the big one, which is, uh, uh, is right here. It's the uh, uh, Vatna Yokol. And uh, this, this is the area, again, that has the most active volcanic activity on the island. The colors, um, the colors, the, the color code here is the uh, blue over here is actually old, old events occurring some 10 million years ago in the tertiary times. And then you gradually, the colors, uh, you, the, the most recent activity is this purple color uh, right here. Um, there is some rhyolite, there are some uh, silicon rich. Uh, lavas, uh, although most of it is basalt, basaltic. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so with the types of eruptions, basically you get all types in Iceland. Uh, you get effusive eruptions, which basically are the lava just pouring out. You also get these, um, uh, and these are, these eruptions can be uh, very long. You can get as much as long as a hundred kilometers of the. Of the flow uh, on the surface from this low viscosity uh, lava. The other extreme is, uh, and there's not as much of this, but the high silicon, uh, low iron rhyolite lavas, uh, and they tend to be much shorter, maybe no more than several kilometers in length, but they tend to be fairly thick because they they're, they're, they have high viscosity. And uh, explosive uh, explosive eruptions occur because of the violent boiling due to the expansion of gases inside the rock. And uh, the, the pressure builds up until you get an explosion like this. And these, uh, the flow, which is called pyroclastic, which you can, uh, people, you've heard lots of talks on volca uh, volcanoes here. And these, these pyroclastic flows can go extremely fast and are extremely hot. Uh, and uh, you don't get out of the way of one of these things because it's coming at you too fast. And uh, Iceland has, you'll see in a second here, Iceland has uh, a lot of explosive volcanoes. So this is the, uh, this gives you a little bit of a, uh, in fact, I got this talk from Thor, this graph from Thor, uh, Thor Thorson himself, he shared with us, John and I, 
one of his talks about the uh, about Iceland uh, geology. And so the mafic, the uh, iron manganese rich, is the dominant uh, form of, uh, of eruptions. And you can see effusive eruptions. These are the number, by the way, in the last 11,000 years. So there's uh, uh, the post-glacial time, 457, uh, but many more explosive uh, eruptions than. These are intermediate between the silicic and the mafic. And there are, there are some of the silicon-rich uh, rhyolite, but not as many. And you can see this is, gives you the volume of the uh, output in cubic uh, kilometers. And the, the bulk of it is, uh, is in the basic uh, combination of lava and the tephra, which is the, uh, the, the material that gets blown out in an explosive eruption. This is uh, some pictures uh, of a of an explosive volcanic uh, eruption. Uh, these, more than 60% of all the events uh, in post are, are of this explosive type, and it, count, and it counts to about 20% of, uh, of the magma output. And these are just some of the uh, amazing pictures of these explosions that occur. And there's a long history of uh, events. The most recent events, actually the most recent is in 2011, but uh, they go back uh, to uh, uh, a thousand years, and uh, there are some very famous ones here. I'll talk a little bit more about, like the uh, cop. Uh, the uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to it anyway. And uh, this is the uh, so this is talking about the Afalya local eruption in April and May of 2010. This was uh, the eruption that caused uh, uh, the, uh, the horrendous delays in air traffic uh, affecting Europe. And uh, the, the glacier, the, the actual volcano is called a shield volcano because it's not steep. It tends to be low angle, has a small caldera and an ice cap that reaches down 1,000 meters below the top. On April 14th, a steam jet arose like this. But then very quickly after that, uh, black smoke uh, and black, uh, uh, very black amounts of uh, tephra of ash and, and stones, uh, stones as small as several, 60 millimeters, and then bombs, that, which are called are objects that are greater than 65 uh, millimeter. And uh, here, so here, this is, this is uh, April 14th, early in the evening, and here's the summit uh, events, uh, the summit vents here, and this is the uh, tephra laden plume that uh, occurred from that, that uh, volcano. Yeah, and so what happened was these eruptions occurred um, in three phases, and they continued until the middle of May, and the strong winds from the southwest caused a lot of this uh, material to uh, uh, be carried over here, and uh, with you know, widespread air, because a lot of the uh, material that came out was uh, ash, fine ash, which uh, airplane engines don't like. This is an aerial picture. This is before, uh, this is the uh, uh, glacier uh, and the uh, volcano before. And there's this big lagoon here. The lagoon is gone uh, in, uh, just uh, uh, several days later. It was, um, this is the second day, in fact. It totally filled in. And there was, uh, it, the eruption produced 300 million cubic meters of tephra, of which half of it was fine ash, very uh, 63 micro, microns uh, thick. It was also 23 million cubic meters of lava uh, for a, a, a whopping total of um, uh, 330 million cubic meters. This was enough to cover central London uh, with 20 centimeters of ash had it occurred there. Uh, this is my picture that I just took on this trip uh, a year ago. A uh, very peaceful glacier up here and, and volcano. Uh, this is the farm that's right down below. This is a picture that's right on the roadside uh, of the start of this activity in 2010. What's interesting about uh, traveling in uh, Iceland, uh, it was just like in Scotland, the geology and the volcanic activity is a big deal. So there's a lot of roadside signs that describe what's happening, what has happened in the past, uh, and they're very, they're very useful. And I ended up photographing them as I went along. 
So this is one of the uh, biggest disasters that have uh, affected uh, sort of mo semi-modern times. It's called, they're called the Lackey eruptions that occurred over a period uh, of about uh, uh, seven years in 1783 to 1784. And uh, these were 10 uh, eruption episodes of explosive uh, uh, events with 6,000 cubic meters of ash and gas separa followed by longer lava flows that raised up to 3,000 uh, meters cubed. The Lackey eruption uh, occurred on a, a 27 uh, kilometer fissure. Um, and so it, the, it, it's, it occurred through a, basically a long uh, crack which had 140 vents and craters, and the uh, the tephra covered 8,000 uh, cubic or square kilometers and produced 120 million tons of SO2. And they these these eruptions lasted until February of it, uh, 1784. The column height reached 15 kilometers and produced a total of 15 cubic uh, kilometers of tephra and lava. So this produced what is called the haze famine. This, uh, this SO2 went up in the atmosphere and became uh, mixed with water and became sulfuric acid. And this uh, caused what's called the haze famine. that killed 20% of the people in Iceland and 50% of the livestock. And, and, and then to make matters much worse, this 15 kilometers of, uh, of uh, ash and, uh, acid and sulfuric acid uh, went up into the uh, tropopause and got caught by the air and dropped uh, this, uh, uh, this sulfuric acid uh, all over uh, northern Europe and even reached as far around as uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the American continent. It caused considerable damage to vegetation all over Europe. The following winter was one of the most severe. The average world temperature chain decreased by 1.3 C. That's a big deal in a very short amount of time. It was one of the worst winters that, that, that occurred uh, uh, that very year. And the famine that ensued was thought to be one of the triggers that caused the French Revolution. So this was a big deal. This shows the, uh, uh, these are, this is the Fisher swarm, uh, the, uh, the Fisher that uh, produced uh, all the, uh, the lackey eruptions. And uh, you, you have these various cones where uh, Tepra and all uh, ended up being uh, blown, blown up. This is what's left over of it. Uh, we have these moss-covered lava fields, uh, and uh, you, you can look, they look very tranquil right now, but it wasn't at the time. Uh, <clears throat> so we're continuing along. Now we're right underneath the large, uh, the large. Uh, uh, the large volcano, and uh, this is the Iceland is considered um, a part of Europe, and so this is the most uh, this is the largest glacier in Europe, and it's the, also the most active uh, area of uh, volcanic activity. There's this huge outwash plain; they call it Sandur Plain, S-A-N-D-U-R, but it's 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 what we have uh, right here. It's an uh, glacial outwash plain with lots of rivers, braided rivers cutting through it. And this is the outwash plain. We got this is in the early one morning with some very nice morning light. This is the largest glacial outwash uh, and it's uh, a thousand uh, square kilometers. It's an alluvial fan of this glacier that's uh, up here. And it's the uh, largest outlet glacier on the south side of this, uh, the large glacier, the Batna Yoko. Uh, and the river is, um, in, 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 is braided. There are some very interesting uh, dramatic events that occur periodically here, and they're called yokolovs, and I'll describe that in a second, but these are huge floods of water that come down from the uh, glaciers uh, when you get an eruption underneath the glacier. Uh, picture without the words. And, uh, just looking back in a different direction, again, the nice lighting in the early morning. So, Yokolovs, what they are, there's a, on, that, on that glacier, on the uh, uh, Blatna Yokol 
glacier, there's a lake. It's called the Grimm's Vault in the lake. And what happens is uh, the thermal activity um, uh, causes, melts the water, and the water eventually fills up the lake. And when that happens, the lake overflows, and the water rushes down through those uh, uh, outwash plains. And a normal uh, event of this type, they produce um, water flows of 5,000 to 10,000 uh, cubic meters a second. But in 1996, something very uh, different happened. There was actually a volcanic eruption at the same time. And this produced flows of 50,000 cubic meters per second. Uh, and blocks that were as large as 2,000 cubic meters came washing down uh, from, from the glacier onto this sand or plain. So a lot of the river, a lot of the road that, uh, they, that, is, uh, that was built along this uh, part of the south shore uh, disappeared. And this is again from one of the roadside signs. You can see the huge section of road that is missing here uh, and the bridge missing here. This is a little leftover reminder of uh, what it was like. Uh, and this is just in 1996. This is, uh, <laughs> this is not long ago. And this is, um, uh, this Grimm's Voten uh, is that lake I was mentioning. This is the most active volcano in, in Iceland, of more than 70 eruptions in the last thousand years. Uh, in 2004, it, um, it produced a, a, a 10 kilometer plume and deposited, uh, you can see in the picture here, uh, 11 uh, meters of, um, of tephra. And it was an explosion. You have the high plume pyroclastic fall and the pyroclastic surge that occurs right here. And this is the, this is the, uh, this is the lake itself, the Green Fulton uh, Lake. So this, this, um, this was uh, produced a, a lot more uh, uh, actual um, uh, magma than uh, lava, than even that Baniokol uh, produced in 63 days. This produced in one week, twice as much as that whole event occurred. So. This was a, a much bigger deal, but it didn't have uh, as dramatic an effect uh, at, at, on Europe, and so you didn't hear as much about it. But the volcanic activity in this general area seems to last uh, about um, uh, 60 to 80 years, and it, then it goes uh, quiet again for a while. So now we're moving further east, and uh, this. Uh, this uh, uh glacier coming down from the, this is the uh, from the, the high plain. This area is where the highest point uh, uh, on the island is, and I'm not even going to pronounce this one, but it's 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 20, it's almost a little over 2,000 meters high, and it's Iceland's highest peak, and uh, it has um, it has an ice field caldera. Uh, which uh, area of about 14 square kilometers. And there is a national park, the Scafatel National Park is right down in this area. And this is just a picture of the, uh, of the rugged mountains uh, on, uh, in that area. Again, nice, uh, some nice uh, color, uh, fall, autumn color. So this is uh, a, a, a one of uh, a very interesting um, spot. This is in the National Park. It's called the Swarty Foss, which means Black Falls. It has a 20 meter uh, waterfall drop, but you notice the basalt columns in the back. And this is one of the best examples of uh, this kind of, uh, of, of this column. Of course, we have a great example of Devil's Tower right here in Wyoming. Uh, but it, this is a process that occurs when the, when the, when the lava is cooled from above and what happens is the, the, as it cools, it contracts and creates these cracks. And it turns out there's a uh, energy, the minimum energy occurs when they form these, uh, these uh, six-sided hexagonal structures, happens to be the, the minimum energy. So these cracks tend to line up in, in, uh, in hexagons. And you can see the blocks down here. Uh, they also are, uh, this one looks like it's five-sided, but they, they, it varies somewhat. But it's, uh, it can range from five to seven side, the dominant the hexagonal. So this is um, right in the same area. Uh, this is the trail that we walked up to get to that uh, waterfall and uh, the nice uh, color. 
fact, that was that was uh, that picture. That was myself and Virginia <laughs> uh, taken by our friends. So now we're moving further along, and uh, we get into this very interesting area. This is right underneath the uh, uh, the large uh, the large uh, glacier, and this is a glacial lake that's formed out in front of the um, the glacier. And what's happened is that the lateral, the, the terminal moraine is back here, and it's, the water is melting and forms a lake between the glacier, active, the glacier itself and the terminal moraine. Uh, but you get these very nice uh, chunks of ice that are break off and, and show. We also had uh, a little bit of rain shower, and uh, the sun came out, and so we managed to get a, another uh, rainbow. This glacier was once uh, at its maximum extent in 1890, it was 250 meters from the coast, but it's now two kilometers from the coast. So this is a, oh yeah, just a picture without the words. Yeah. And this is uh, the same. Uh, this is the same lake, just a, a little different view, but you can you can see up the waves, the nice cloud effects, makes great photography. And further along, um, this is just another maybe uh, uh, 10 or 15 kilometers is another, even a much larger uh, glacial lake. Uh, and this is the big glacier in the background uh, coming. And these, uh, this was connected, <clears throat> this one actually has an outlet to the ocean. And so you'll get tidal effects where the ocean will wash in and so these big blocks of ice are moving back and forth with the tide. So, uh, so here we are, we're, uh, we're out on the southern coast, now we're going to head on the east coast, and the, cha the scenery here changes dramatically uh, because we get out of this active area and we get into an area where there was uh, volcanic activity um, in the tertiary times, 3 to 12 million years ago, so there's not any active ac activity out here. Um, and this just shows you, uh, this blue, blue color is the uh, tertiary uh, lava that's uh, 12 to 10 million years old, and the, the newer, uh, more recent activity, which just runs right along, right through the island, like I showed earlier. So, yeah, so this was the first night. We were right at the very far southeastern corner in a town called Hofen, H O. FN, and it was the first night we had the Northern Lights. And there's still clouds up here, but what was kind of nice about that was that we were getting a nice reflection of it in the water, so we were right on the coast, and that was, that was, that was very pretty. And we, had, we had made various, uh, we had gone to, uh, early on, we, when we had a clear night, we would go out and camp out trying to see if, but there was no activity. But this was a night that uh, was pretty clear and was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, solar activity. So we got these wonderful um, green, in this case, green. There is some red here, too. The, uh, the green color is oxygen, and the red is nitrogen uh, being ionized by the uh, solar particles. This is the following morning. This is the large Vatna Yokel uh, glacier, and we're moving along the east side of it. So we are into a region which is uh, tertiary rock on the east coast, uh, inactive. Uh, beautiful pig sky again. This is a, a, looks like a lake, but it's actually on the it's ocean water. But there's a little band out here that of land, and uh, the ocean water comes through back and forth through little inlets. In Newfoundland, where we sail a lot, these were called barrasways up along the east coast, so we follow the coast up to here, then we go in one of the, uh, um, one of the fjords uh, and then go inland, uh, although we make a, a, another trip out uh, here. And then we get on to the <coughs> north coast, uh, which is, things change dramatically back again. This is one of the cute little towns along the east coast. What was amazing about Iceland is how clean everything was. These boats are immaculate. There's no trash anywhere, it's just, uh, just well, very well maintained uh, and very clean. These are some 1790 buildings, uh, 
that were in this little town. This is a waterfall, so we've come up along this, uh, uh, along uh, the, uh, followed the end of this, uh, uh, water, the water, and we're now climbing out uh, from the uh, um, fjord up over a high pass, and, and uh, we just happened upon another waterfall. This are, these various uh, horizontal bandings, these are various basaltic events that have occurred, lava events, and the cracks are cooling cracks that occurred during the cooling, forming these dikes. Which is the close-up of this waterfall. And we, uh, this, um, I mentioned, we went back to the coast again and we, we, we got into this uh, uh, additional fjord. Uh, this is welded basaltic tough uh, ash that's become solidified. Nice reflection in the water here. This is actually a harbor uh, where, where fishing boats are. Now on the north coast, we're going to, the first thing uh, we did when we got to the north coast was we went out up this uh, particular, uh, uh, it turns out a valley, and there's this uh, 30 kilometer long canyon that was carved out by one of these yokelops, these floods that, that occur when you get uh, eruptions underneath the large glacier. And then further, um, uh, north, we're going to see other examples of the mid-ocean rift as we uh, as we approach it. This is the gully that this is uh, this happened. This um, this nine-kilometer canyon right here was caused by uh, an amazing amount of water that came down through here. Uh, I think about 10,000 years ago. This is the Denny Foss. This is uh, in that same area. This is the largest waterfall in terms of water volume in Europe. And this Yokolov that created this whole waterfall canyon was 2,500 years ago. And it, uh, the peak discharge was 500,000 cubic meters per second of water. Um, and, uh, so, uh, 10 cubic kilometers of water came rushing down from underneath that glacier. This is a, a, another a waterfall right in the same area. We just happened to have some nice lighting. We went and we followed this all the way up to the north, and we, uh, you come. This particular formation is sort of where this uh, uh, the water, uh, where the end of this uh, uh, water yokelop occurred, and it created this canyon uh, that's there with some nice uh, nice trees. Now we're along the north coast. Um, uh, and proceeding west now, you see the uh, the sheep, horses, and this is a, a, a cute town called Husvik uh, along that uh, northern perimeter. This is a fishing uh, this is a fishing village. There are also a lot of tourist activities that occur here. The tourist activities pretty much end. Yeah, the hotels are still open, but a lot of the activities like uh, chart boats and what have charter boats end at the end of September. And so this is, we're into early, November, early October here. And so there wasn't an awful lot of activity, but uh, very pretty church. And then this, uh, we, we, went, we got to where we're going uh, and we stayed for uh, 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 a town called My Vatten, actually it's a lake, and this is where we got the best display of northern lights. Um, and I was uh, taking these with four second exposures. I started with 15 seconds, but it was too, too slow because these things were changing faster than that. And so these patterns are changing all the time. So you're looking at, um, if you look, there's some reddish color in this, it's a little hard to see, but all this green is uh, oxygen atoms being excited uh, by the solar particles and then decaying back and giving up this green light. That was the one I showed at the very beginning. This is really bright here. I mean, this is, you have no trouble seeing what's going on because this just lights up the whole area. So this is where this particular event was coming to an end. 
But um, you can see the stars uh, quite clearly. And so being an astronomer, I uh, had to identify what I was looking at. So, <laughs> so that's the Pleiades. Yeah, and this is the uh, Auriga uh, constellation, the bright first magnitude star, Capella, and uh, Andromeda, and Perseus. Okay, to go back. And this is looking the other direction. This is looking. It's interesting enough. The northern lights are not in the north. They come. From, they go from east to west. So we look east. We were looking at. You see, this was October, and the Pleiades uh, were just coming up in the east, and that was low in the eastern sky. And now I'm looking uh, in the opposite direction, west. Again, you could see. Now you could definitely see red color here. That's the nitrogen in the air. Okay, so we're now in the northern volcanic zone, and this is a very this is another area just like down here where there's a lot of activity, uh, thermal activity going on, and uh, the Mid Atlantic Rift is exiting Iceland. Um, this uh, is uh, this lake called Lake Mývatn is a paradise of volcanology. There's there's volcanoes everywhere here. Uh, there's these two here, uh, and uh, lots of uh, there, there's activity right in the lake, um, little what they call rootless cones, which I'll explain in a bit. But um, this is uh, it's on the edge of what's called the Krafla volcanic system. It's very active. Uh, a lot of thermal recovery is uh, done here. The current landscape um, is uh, about 20 was about 20 was formed about 2,800 years ago uh, at the birth of this particular volcano, the Haverfall volcano. And uh, it was pretty much shaped away as it is now. So this is actually looking from the north as we approached uh, from the north coming in. So this is the Haverfall volcano here. And this is the, um, something called the Luted Crater over here. We end up climbing this the next day. You'll see some pictures here shortly. Um, and in fact, this is it. So this, is, uh, this uh, crater is perfectly shaped, uh, tough cone. It's the largest structure on a two kilometer fissure. It's about uh, 90 to 150 meters high, 1,000 meters in diameter, and it consists of many tephra beds dipping uh, uh, in all directions from the crater. Uh, crater was formed by uh, the rocket column and pyroclastic surges uh, transported by the uh, round clouds and ended up forming this nice, perfectly shaped uh, crater. And that's a picture without the words. And that's the lake. There is, yeah, that's a trail right there. We walked up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we didn't, but I think you probably could. Yeah. That's this is some kind of faulting effect here. This is not not the trail is right here that I walked up from from down in the valley. This is a view uh, from um, of the lake, and uh, these are called rootless cones, and I'll explain that in a second. This lake is very interesting. It's very. It's the second largest lake. Uh, it, uh, it's only four. Uh, it's up about uh, 100 meters above sea level, but its, uh, its average depth is only four meters. So it's very shallow. And these are root, what, what are called rootless cone islets. And what a rootless cone is, is that uh, you have a, a lava uh, pouring out and solidifying, and and then it forms. But it, there's still lava flowing underneath. And what the lava flowing underneath comes to uh, some weakened area in the crust above, and uh, it, it produces actually a small little cone. And it's rootless because the actual source of the lava is not underneath the cone. It's, it's flowing uh, laterally underneath the cones. And, and the cones represent uh, escape paths. So this is the Haberfall volcano that occurred uh, um, in uh, 2,800 years ago. This just shows the, uh, the, the amount of material that was um, in meters high uh, around, uh, around the volcano. This is the, uh, uh, more act this is the current active area. Um, these are eruptions. And this is the prof uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the current volcano, the Krafla, the Krafla uh, caldera, and the, the various fissures that occur on it. Um, the Viti uh, eruption, 
you know, I'll show you a picture of that. But these, these eruptions, the first eruptions in this area occurred in 1724, but they've also repeated themselves uh, fairly recently. This is the Vidi crater, and, um, and uh, uh, this shows the, uh, in 1984, there was another eruption. This, the darker um, uh, purple here is the new uh, lava and, and fissures, and the lighter is the, is the older from the 1700s. And there's a big plant there. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a cult, that's a cult there. That's the Krafla caldera. Yeah, Krafla caldera. Yeah, the Krafla of, uh, and the Viti crater and, and this whole air, fissure area that occurs. And uh, this, a um, lot of thermal activity. There's uh, boardwalks and places to walk around uh, uh, like you might see at Yellowstone. This is an interesting uh, place. This is called the Gritogia. It was a popular bathing place until this eruption occurred in the uh, 1975. It became too hot, but you can go down there and look, and it's, uh, it's very pretty. Uh, we're seeing the reflection of the water here, of the walls in the water. And right on top of this, and, and this was in that, not mentioned in a book, I, we just saw it, we just climbed up here and looked. Here is the uh, rift again. Uh, and this is the uh, this is the rift, the cracking that occurred, and this occurred in the 1975 to 84 uh, period, uh, and it's about nine meters wide, and a, a total of 21 uh, rifting events occurred in this period, and a similar widening occurred in the 1700 eruption. What's happening is there, it, it it's widens the the Atlantic Rift is widening by about two centimeters a year, but it doesn't do it continuously. Uh, the effect uh, occurs in big steps, and so this is one step that occurred in, uh, uh, in 1975. And so the average is still two centimeters, but it goes a thousand years between them. So, <laughs> um, and so this is looking the other way, uh, and the, so these are uh, these uh, these two peri these two uh, these two uh, activities, 1700s and, and recently. Um, were the only activity in this thousand years. So it made the average right, but it, it occurs in discrete events. This this uh, grotto that I showed you pictures of is right underneath here. So I didn't realize, I didn't think this was going to, I had no idea what was up here. We were very lucky to discover this because it's not mentioned. This is the uh, last of the big waterfalls. Uh, this is called the Godafoss at sunset. It's called the Waterfall of the Gods. It's not real high, but it's quite wide. And it was the history here is that in year 1000 there was a, a, a conversion to Christianity, and the uh, the the, uh, the actual leader uh, threw all his Norse gods into the waterfall, and so it's called the God of the God, uh, the God waterfall, waterfall of the gods. It's a challenging picture to obtain. <coughs> All of my, a lot of my pictures are taken with uh, our high dynamic range. So I'm taking three pictures so I can capture the, uh, uh, the darkness. So here's some, uh, the, the other lady that was with us, uh, Janet uh, Grant, is a, a, a bird photographer. And so we would drive along and then she would yell out and we'd stop and take pictures of birds. Or we would stop and, and see some interesting geology. So it, this was a trip that uh, stop, the stopping events were either for bird life or geology, uh, geology. So the last part of the trip was out onto this uh, west peninsula, the Snaefilis Peninsula, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, we spent the last uh, day there. Uh, this shows the, uh, what's going on. These are the old, the, the blue color is the, uh, the tertiary basalt. The, more, the newer uh, material is out here in the very end. But it, none of it's very new. The last eruption, even though this is considered active, the last eruption was a thousand years ago. Uh, so it's um, well, you'll see. We do a little cave trip here, and so they were, it was nice to, that we didn't have to worry about an eruption occurring. <laughs> this is one of the towns that was on, right on that north coast of the Snaefellus, and again, more basaltic. Uh, um, 
some of the beautiful uh, scenery. Uh, the weather was closing in on us. This is the, the end. Towards the end of the trip, we had our worst weather. But it was interesting. It was so bad. It was interesting. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is a Lutheran church um, in the same area. This is uh, the, the uh, Kirk Kirkofels. This is the uh, uh, a cone of the, the, the church rock essentially. And you can see over the last uh, uh, 10,000 years the various layers. The purple layers are, um, uh, are, are, are lava. Uh, the, the, green, the blue here is tertiary. And then the greens, are, the green is uh, sedimentary layers. And then there's a, a, a little moldberg at the very top of it. This next picture is along the coast going out towards the end of this peninsula. Black, uh, uh, base, black sand beach. Ground up basalt, and this is the this was the day. This is the next day. This was really a rotten day, as I say. It was so it was so bad. It was interesting because these we we were both Alan and I, the other fellow, are sailors, and we're this is a lee shore here, and it's blowing about fifty or sixty knots. I mean, it is really hooting, and it's hard to stand. And uh, these we noticed the waves. Right, this was just a place where God. So great, grateful that we're not in a boat. I <laughs> this is this is really amazing. Yeah. Look at the waves here. Just, just What's the height of the cliff? Yeah, it's um yeah it uh, it's probably about thirty you know maybe less than a hundred feet but you know maybe on the order of 40, 60, 70 feet maybe. Yeah. Well, in fact, if you go back to the previous picture, that's you can see it right here. That's the um, uh, uh, the, the interesting uh, uh, tower here, and that gives you something. So it's 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 probably more like 50 feet. So this was interesting too. So you have all this basaltic lava, and this uh, white, this yellow sand beach. And I said, how how did that happen? So. I have no idea, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there had to be some, uh, you know, silicon-rich material here because this is a looks like an ordinary uh, uh, silicon-like uh, beach. Then, what do you do in a lousy day? Well, you do a cave tour, and, 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 and so we did a cave tour. And uh, so this is uh, we're going down into a lava tube, and. Uh, you can see it. It's, it's pretty high, um, and uh, these tubes um, th th these tubes are formed because the lava is, is cool on the surface, but it's still hot underneath, and the lava is, is flowing. You can see the guide's head here. If you want to get a scale to this, if you look carefully, there it is. And uh, you have a, a stalactite or stalagmite. And we did a little walk along in the rain along the shoreline. All the reddish rock from the, uh, you know, the, the mafic uh, basaltic lava. Then this is the last little event we did. Uh, we, uh, on the way back to uh, Reykjavik, we stopped at something called the Elborg volcano. Six, 5,000 years old is another splatter cone volcano where, it came, where the, the lava came up in, in liquid form and it landed in splatters because it was still liquid. It's uh, a volcano, I'll show you, it's 250 meters um, uh, uh, long, 180 meters wide, 50 meters above the surrounding terrain. And that's the picture of it. It's about a six kilometer uh, return walk to get to this, so it's a nice, and it wasn't raining, so that was nice. So here we are, back in Reykjavik, and um, this is, uh, the Lutheran Cathedral there, and guess what inspired these uh, this is, uh, <laughs> basaltic columns. And um, this is uh, right along the shore in the harbor at Reykjavik. And, and this is uh, Iceland, excuse me, this is Greenland on the way back from Iceland. And we were flying over it, and we, uh, and so we were able to get this nice picture of uh, Greenland. Okay, so um, this is a proposed trip. Uh, uh, some, it's going to be, we think, around September 18th, October 8th. 
And uh, this is the same map I showed before, but we've actually laid out the days uh, that, that uh, Thor suggested uh, these places to stay. And so it's, a, it, it's more days uh, at one place. We never stayed at one place more than one day, and that was here. But this would have several days, maybe on the average of three, two to three days, four way up here in my back in that area. Was so <coughs> interesting. And then I took a few pictures of, I, I had to show a few of my more recent uh, pictures. This, this is um, of the Veil Nebula, and this is the whole nebula, this, uh, bo both pieces of it. And there's the southern, the western piece. This is a, a, my, with my 20 inch telescope um, of, of this feature here. This woman, I think of this as a woman flying with red hair, <laughs> dress, her arm is out in front of her, and her dress, and, and she's leaving this vapor trail. But, you know, so that's, this is my six inch telescope. This is with my 20 inch telescope. And then this is, a, this is also, uh, this is, looks like a dog's head to me. And that's at the end of that upper feature. So. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> we have time for just a few questions. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it's one part. It's one part of the grotto. It was the question was was that actually the rip that we saw at the grotto? And the answer is that's one half of it. These uh, is is one edge of the uh, the fold, and the, at the other edge there's and the grotto is in between. But that is one of the edges, just like I showed early in the talk. That uh, that's it. it's the same feature except on the north shore rather than the south. No, no uh, it was earthquakes. No earthquakes uh, this time, uh, but it, it, it happens. I mean, there's a lot of faulting going on. Uh, that, that old, if you look at a, uh, a detailed uh, geological map, there's faults all over it in that air, rift area. Yeah. Mike, the uh, geothermal plants that you were showing in the photograph, is that all the process heat? Uh, Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, so they have to pipe that into That's right. Center. Yeah, they, they once were thinking about, I mean, one one use of, of course, all that energy is it would be a, a aluminum plant, but it never happened. It, it, it was just too, they were thinking of ways to pipe that. It, it's just too far from Europe there. So, but that's all for heating. Uh, you know. yeah, like, well, certainly electricity plus actual heat, thermal heat for houses. I, 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 I'm, I, I would guess yes, but you know there isn't a tremendous amount of farming that occurs. There is some, there is some farming, but not. Yeah. Well, What's the wildlife situation? Um, yeah, so a lot of birds um, and uh, horses, but we didn't see an awful lot else, did we, Virginia? No. Birds, quite a quite a variety of birds. Those barrels, Golden Eye, were the ones that I the most recently shot. Yeah. Uh, How many hours of daylight did you have? Oh, what? How many hours of daylight? Yeah, this was interesting. This was uh, we started this trip October eighth. So on on September twenty first, it was twelve hours, right? On October eighth, it was two hours less. It was, uh, and, it was and it was going down fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was only 10 hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah we get, the way the time zones work, it, it's, you didn't get light until about 6, at 8 o'clock in, in the morning, and it, it sunset about 6. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How big are the tides there? Um, they're, they're not horrendous, but they're, they're decent because, I, I, I'm, I'll just wing it. I, I'm saying, you know, 5 or 6 feet. Because there was a lot of motion of, the, of these ice blocks in that one uh, glacial lake. And you could see them moving back and forth pretty fast. So there was a fair amount of current. Elizabeth? Uh, what were the people like? I know in Greenland they are considered uh, natives and Inuit. So what kind of folk actually live there? What's their political? Yeah, they're, um, they're, 
they're, they're uh, from, uh, they're basically European. I mean, yeah, yeah they're Scandinavian. Yeah. yeah, I didn't see any uh, what you would call, uh, you know, quote unquote native uh, Icelandic. I think they're Inuit from yeah. the same group. Yeah, it could have been, but I, I, I we didn't. See, I don't. There were not enough people there. To, <laughs> As you can see, I mean, most of the people in Iceland live in Reykjavik. I mean, that's where, it, and there are some larger towns on the north coast, but uh, most the people live by and large in, in the uh, towns. Uh, uh. What kind of temperatures? Oh, it was like awfully nice. Yeah, it, at night when we were out doing our um, gazing at stars in the northern lights. It was cold enough, it was probably in the 40s with some wind, so we were wearing down parkas. But during the day, um, like in that really rainy day, it was probably in the 50s, it was a cold, raw day. But when the sun came out, we were in you know, a, a light jacket, you know, 70 degrees. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't real cold. Mike, there's a question right here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what would you attribute the large number of explosive erupts? It seems like all the Magma was primarily basaltic. Yeah. Was that the presence of water? Water. Okay. And gas. Okay. Water and gas uh, it dissolved in the the heat the, the heat uh, from uh, the volcano just heats heats that up and it builds up the pressure and it explodes. When basalt columns form, it's almost it's crystalline. No, it's. But is that a deceptive? It's thing? not crystalline. It's not crystalline, but it, it, it the cracks are forming. There, it, it's it's uh, yeah, they're definitely not crystalline, but but the, but the cracks are forming because uh, the, 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 it's contracting the, as it cools. You're getting the contraction, and the, the physics of that crack propagation generates this hexagonal shape. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it's not crystalline. Uh -huh. It's amorphous. Now the crystalline rock, crystalline rock is down. You know, it's the gabbro or granite, and that's underneath. Um, what is their primary source of protein? Um, yeah, well, fish, and, uh, and, and you saw a lot of critters running, walking around, lamb. And, yeah. So they hunt? They hunt, yeah. And horse? They, they eat those horses, too. <laughs> yeah, we were shocked. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there is, I, but I, we didn't run across that. I, I, I didn't. But there, you know, there has to be. Yes? Doesn't the coast look a lot like it looked in the northwest coast of Scotland? Yeah, there's, uh, there's some similarities. Uh, there's some similarities. Yeah, well, and as you can see, the, uh, this whole volcanic region really one spans that whole space between Greenland and Scotland. And, and Except in Scotland, it's much, much older rocks, whereas here, it's much that's younger right. rocks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mike, is there much, much on the interior of the island that's interesting, or is it? No, there is. It, it, it's just that it's uh, there's it's hard to get to, uh, and there are these amazing machines that people that you can you can get on a tour and go inland, and depending on uh, what the weather is like, we may end up doing some of that. Uh, we didn't do it. Yeah. I think Virginia had a question. Well, actually, it was just a comment about the uh, horses. The breed of horse is very unique to Iceland. And if someone decides they're going to race their horse off of the island, they cannot bring the horse back because they're worried about contamination of their species. So uh, they have all that respect for these uh, unique horses, but they we were, that's why, partly why we were so shocked to find they use them as food, but they do. <laughs> yeah, when I was thinking about Scotland, I was thinking more about uh, uh, like uh, the um, the very western and the volcanic. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Certainly, the uh, once you go further east, it's all very different rock. Well, please join me in thanking Mike for a very.